Hey everybody, thanks for listening to another episode of Lionheart Radio. I wanted to get your ear for a minute before we get into this episode because I wanted to warn you if you are traveling with kids or sensitive to any kind of language or vulgar talk, then this might not be the episode for you. But that being said, we at Lionheart Radio, it's super important that we provide an unfiltered and a candid look into the not only the success of athletes, but also the mindset of athletes. And I think it's really cool to take a snapshot at top performers uh, and not censor them, not edit them, and look at uh, exactly how they view life, how they go through life, and you know, typically how they crush it. So hopefully at this point you've Turn the show off if you are traveling with kids. And if not, then uh, you've been forewarned. And on with the fucking show. All right, welcome back to Lionheart Radio. I'm your host, Rick Alexander, founder of Louis Vive in San Diego, California. And my guest today is Robert Oberst. He is a World's Strongest Man competitor, got his pro card in 2012, and among other things, he's a stand-up comedian, actor. Uh, Robert, thanks for being on today. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, don't give me don't give me too much credit for stand-up comedian thing. I went up on stage once. I don't want to offend the guys who actually dedicate themselves to that craft. Oh, really? Where, where, did, where did you go? Where did you uh, you go to an open mic night? No, I wasn't open mic night. I was invited on stage at uh, the Comedy Store, which, I mean, if you're going to get your feet wet, that's that's the place to be. But I uh, went up there and told a story and had some fun. It was it was a lot of fun. I think uh, they gave me three minutes and I took like eight and a half. <laughs> I was an asshole from the beginning. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So, uh I'll start from the beginning then. What is it that got you into Strongman in the first place? Uh, Strongman for me was, um, it's pretty, it sounds unique, but it's pretty similar to a lot of guys' stories. We, um, I played football for a long time and I was done. It was done with me. It wasn't going anywhere. And uh, I started working security. A friend of mine was doing it. And so I, I just decided one day, because he just kept bugging me and bugging me about it. One day I just decided I was going to go check it out and uh, went in. And on that first day, the uh, first time I ever touched the log press, I broke the amateur world record just messing around and uh, put it down. And I was like, so is that any good? And he looks at me and he's like, get the fuck out of my gym. <laughs> and it was about uh, a little less than six months later, I had my pro card and I was on my way. Oh, damn. Okay. So did you have some insane gym numbers that he knew about? Like, what is it that, or was it just because you were a, a big guy? Well, he and I played junior college ball together. We were rivals in high school. He was a good friend, longtime friend. And, um, you know, I'm big, but ev- everyone that I played with knew I was strong. I just built really well for lifting. You know, it's, it's, uh, like big barrel chest and the right length arms, big sick wrists and all that stuff. And I was still quick, which actually in strongman is a big deal. It's not like powerlifting, you know. We're not going to stand still and do three lifts. We've got to move and be athletic and have cardio. So I, I'm built pretty much as good as you can for the sport. I wish I had a little bit shorter to- torso, but that's about it. Okay, what 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 is your size? What's your what is your height and weight? Six seven and a half. Right now, I'm a skinny three seventy five. God damn. So before you were a strongman, before you were a pro strongman. It, was it weird viewing anything else? What did you do beforehand? I never had like a legit like nine to five. Um, uh, as a, in college, in college, I worked at a group home for mentally um, mentally disabled children, and um, I did that for quite a while. And I I did construction for like a week because as soon as you get a guy like me in in a construction setting they always want you to carry heavy shit all the way around them so i was done with that real quick i'm not i'm not into uh hard manual labor like that it just feels like everyone's wanted me to do that since i was a kid so i i just don't like it at all and then um did security for a long time security guard bouncer that kind of stuff it comes pretty easy and it's it's good money usually yeah, I bet as a uh, as a bouncer, you probably didn't need to enforce your size or very much, right? Nah, I mean, I started at like 16, so I was still at that wild age where I wanted to do that. But, you know, as you get older, uh, 
at least for me, as I got older, I didn't, I didn't necessarily want to be involved in conflict. I would just, I was much better at just talking people down and stuff. It's, it's, it really is easier when you're looking like me. Yeah. 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 For sure. I imagine you could talk, talk me out of just about damn near anything. Yeah. It depends, man. There's also, it's, there's these guys that come in and they're, they're in this, I'm going to prove myself mode and they don't care at all about, uh, you know, size or anything. They just want to act, you know, froggy. So <laughs> it happens. It's happened a few times. It's happened a few times. Yeah. There's always the dudes that are, you know, kind of big and they always see the biggest dude and instantly want to fight them. Right. For sure. It's always a guy who's kind of big and it's never, the good thing is, is a guy who really knows how to throw down, that guy's not coming into a bar trying to fight. Like you get like some guy who's like an MMA fighter and trained and, and, and educated in the, the art of violence, that guy tends to just be cool and calm. You know, he's not coming in there trying to pick a fight. So I've, I've been extremely lucky. I've never been on the losing end of a fight. Yeah, there's something to say for that confidence, I think, probably is what you're kind of alluding to, right? It's kind of like the same thing with, uh, with like the bros in the gym, right? The guys that are actually strong don't do a lot of uh, talking about it and, and flexing on other dudes, you know? Yeah, exactly that. Exactly that. You know, you don't have to pretend because you're, you're just that guy and that's who you are. Yeah, right. Exactly. So when people see you uh, competing in, in something like the world's strongest man, which is probably where a lot of people have seen you uh, and you're carrying cars around and things like that, it's obviously really hard to, it looks crazy and it's hard to get a feel for what that is. So uh, what are some of your like basic gym numbers, I guess, that would maybe help people like get an idea about how strong someone like you really is? uh basic gym numbers like deadlift uh, yeah yeah my deadlift has been stuck around the same thing it, it's always been since i started i i've got a unique background with deadlift in football we didn't do deadlifts we did power cleans and hang cleans and stuff like that so that's my my lagging event my deadlift is uh maxed out at 400 kilos which is 880 pounds then uh my squat I, I haven't really one rep max my squat, but it's in the nines, like mid nines ish. You know, my my bench is really good, even though I don't really max that out. My bench is probably like six fifty, six forty five, somewhere right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because for strong man, it's a lot more like the Viking press, a lot more the overhead type move, maneuver. Right, right, correct. Yeah. yeah. And I, I don't neglect the bench like a lot of guys do. I think uh, see, I have the strongest shoulders in America. I've got the American record in log press. I've got the, uh, the second biggest overhead press of, in the history of the world. And I'm taking first before I'm done. Uh, it's, I've got really strong shoulders. And I, I uh, attribute that to making sure that I hit my bench press. And a lot of guys just skip out on that because they, they think it's predominantly a pec workout it's a pec uh movement but it's not really like if you do it properly and you get enough reps and everything it's it's a lot of front deltoid as well so like i mean i don't really have to make an argument for it because i'm strong enough to just say it's true and it works right, right right so let me ask you this in order to get more transfer from the bench to the overhead press do you find yourself moving your hands in closer grip on the bench i think it depends on your body I've got a big old barrel chest, so my hands are really wide. But um, you know, it's it's one of those things you gotta you gotta watch somebody do it. You gotta make sure their elbows are tucked, their back's locked, and they're coming down with control. They're not dropping it and slamming it around. I hate I hate when I see guys throwing a weight around like it's like a, some kind of a rag doll. They don't have to control it. You know, it's strength isn't being able to cheat a weight around. It's being able to control the weight. So, you know, I, I would say it really depends on the person. They'd have to set up right and finish right, and then you'd figure it out from there. Yeah, sure. And you mentioned when you were playing football that you, you worked the power clean, which is actually pretty standard, I think, for, for football teams. Do you work any of the Olympic movements now? Yeah, I did five sets of 20 on hand cleans today. Oh, I, I do, uh, it was 275. Okay. Yeah, so you say five sets of what? 20. Oh Jesus Christ! <laughs> yeah, okay. I had to get my yeah. cardio in, man. I've been I've been in the woods for about two weeks and uh, came back and I just I felt like working and then sweating like crazy. So I had the heater on in the gym and I was doing those. And in between those, I just went over to the bench press uh, 
and do 20 reps on two plates just, just as fast as I could. And then take about 45 seconds off and do it again. Yeah, for sure. When I was uh, playing football, it was like a, they taught the cleanest, like a deadlift, bang it off your thighs, reverse curl as fast as you can. <laughs> do you think, is that how, how you taught or do you feel like you have a... a... That's basically what I do. It's not, it's not very, uh, it's not proper Olympic, I'm sure. It's, it's more of a muscle, a muscle clean. Yeah. But... Yeah, but five sets of 270, five sets of 20 at 275, I don't feel like it matters if you're technically proficient or not. Right, right. The the muscles are getting their work in. Right. So, all right. So one of the big differences between power lifters and strongman is the fact that there is a conditioning piece in, other than the fact that it's more of an odd implement type strength, there's a conditioning piece as well, which is like, you know, loading stones and carrying sandbags and things like that. So how much of your training is, I guess, maximal strength? And then how much of it is like more of the conditioning piece? Um, most of it's uh, kind of in the middle, you know, like I don't, I think it's, uh, it's very silly for people that just go out and bang 90 percentile all in and out all day, every day. That's, that's some of the dumb, you see these guys break down within months of starting and trying to figure out what to do because they they're almost maxing on a regular basis. So in my experience and then what I've studied and in talking to people that I, I, uh, I believe do it properly. I don't, I don't mess around with that stuff. So like normally, like we'll just talk about deadlift. I only max deadlift maybe three times a year. You know, if, if that, if, if I can avoid it, I will. And then, uh, I, I stick to like at the at the least sets of like three or four. I'll, I'll bang out sets of three or four all day, and then when I'm done with those, I come down and I rep it out like crazy. So I like drop sets type stuff. stuff. Yeah, drop sets. I like suicides, man. Suicides. I like stuff that makes you have uh, you know get a gut check. That's the biggest part in this sport, in my opinion, is mental. It's it's so big when you get into you get into a show. I've seen over and over and over there's some guy who's way stronger than this other guy but for some reason he can't fucking beat him you know there's there's guys that are like scared of this one event and all of a sudden like their whole day crashes because of this one thing and it happens it happens all the time it's it's every single show i've ever been to there's somebody screwing themselves over with mental weakness so i i really push the mental game i push it in how i act how i talk how i carry myself but I push it in my training as well. Like I want to try and break myself over and over and over. And it's to the point now where like to break myself, I need somebody there to make sure they can pull the weight off me. Cause that's the only way I can get to that point. Damn. Yeah. And let me ask you this. I'm always interested in what, what a competitor's opinion is. Do you think that mental fortitude piece can be trained or do you think it's going to be something you're born with? Oh, it can definitely be trained. Everyone has a choice. The, 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 Excuses, man. I, I'm not one to take excuses, no matter what. Where you say you're short, you're you got short arms or whatever the fuck ever your excuses. That's all bullshit. Vitotus Lawless was in first place at World Strongest Man. Ended up finishing in second. Um, it was 2014, 13. I don't remember. But he's five six. He's got second place at World Strongest Man. There's oh, damn. excuses. He's a pit bull. He's a monster. So, it's yes, there are some things that are going to be harder for some people, but some people will take that and say, oh, life fucked me, and that's the end of that. And some other people will say, hell no, that means I just got to work. And I, I, I prefer the latter. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. And when you're when you're talking about like mental toughness, are, are you training it by doing these like longer type sets? Because clearly, you know, you you alluded to the fact that you were you were born with it. Are you training it by doing these these longer sets like you mentioned, or are there other other techniques, I guess? Because I'm curious for people that are listening to this that might think yeah. Yeah, they're lacking in that, right? How, how, do they, how do they train that? Yeah. Um, well, what I do is I do those long sets, like I said. Uh, for say, I just did a show in Texas about a month ago, and I knew it was going to be hot. So what I did was I made sure I was in the gym when nobody else was there, so I could turn the heater on all the way up. I wore a sweatshirt the whole time. I ran in the sun. It would be 100 degrees outside, and I'd run with a sweatshirt on. I'd do hill sprints in the, the hottest part of the day, in the middle of the desert out by my house. I, I do a lot of different little things. I'll, 
I'll do fasted cardio in the morning or, you know, different things like that. Like, it really depends on what's coming up and, and what what I have as an option around me. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm looking for that edge all the time. I remember listening and studying Mike Tyson as a kid. And I remember him talking about he likes to get up and run at four o'clock in the morning because he thinks that his opponents are still asleep and that gives him the edge. That's the mentality it takes to be a beast. Mm. Yeah, there's a there's a Tim Grover quote. It's like there is no beast mode. There's only uh, beasts, and they're like that all the time. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It gets it, it conflicts with other parts of life. I'm not going to tell you it doesn't, but you know, if you if you want to be that guy, you got to just flip your mindset. It's an all day, every day thing. Yeah. So so let me ask you about that. The lifestyle aspect uh, is your lifestyle set up completely around being a pro strongman. Yeah, it's not. I mean. There's a lot of differences. When you ask that, um, there's levels of that. So, like, if you were to look at what Brian Shaw does all day, every day, I'd say his lifestyle is as conducive to being a strong man as possible. And I don't like that. I don't I don't want to live that way. I don't want to be that guy. It's not. It's not worth it to stop existing in every other part of of the world and my life and my friends and family and all that just to be a strong man it's uh it's great that he does it it's it's cool and he's obviously amazing because of it right uh, just that's that's not me man i mean i'm i'm different <laughs> yeah i like i like the way i do it and i think i'm doing really good i had i had to tone down the wild side a little bit and focus a little more and then I got a little too much into it, and I realized I wasn't having fun, so I dialed it back a little. I'm at this point in my career right now where I'm healthy, I feel strong, I'm lighter than I've ever been, but stronger than I've ever been. I'm having fun, and I'm doing great. Like I, I did so good at this show in Texas. I feel really excited about America Strong Stand coming up, and uh, you know, it's. I think I'm right there, and it's it's focused but fun still yeah for sure at that show in texas were you there with robert kearney yes i was okay yeah we had him on the show uh world's strongest gay so he's good fun he's fun so you you mentioned that you had to you had to tone the lifestyle aspect back about it so people that follow you on social media like you definitely post a lot about uh about the lifestyle <laughs> about your <laughs> lifestyle and yeah. you hashtag till the wheels fall off what is that <laughs> what is that about <laughs> You want the graphic version or the uh, the PG version? No, nah, I want the. This isn't CNN. I want the graphic <laughs> version. I had a guy. I had a guy hit me up. Uh, what was he saying? He was bugging me because it's very rare. But some people get mad that that I'm not just lifting weights and being like I pick things up and I put them down, you know. And it's like they expect me to be that person, which is it's ridiculous. Like fans. Like, yeah, I mean, if you, I don't know, I think a fan is somebody who likes me for who I am, you know, and that's the most part, that's that's what I have. Like, people love that, I, guess, I, don't, I don't think there's anyone else out there that's as honest as I am about stuff. There's there's nobody out there speaking their opinion or talking about what they do. It's Everyone's very guarded, and it's, it's understandable. Social media can wreck you in a moment. It can take, I feed my family with this, so... That can be taken away very quickly. So I understand why people are guarded. I just choose not to be. And people like me for it. So um, I had this guy who was just on my ass about, like, I'm in the woods and I'm doing this and I'm I'm wakeboarding and I'm hanging out with all these girls in bikinis and what is this and that, which is, first off, it's ridiculous because I hit every single one of my workouts and put them all on videos, filmed all that stuff. I, I, I did go hard. Like, that was, that was part of it. I went hard. And showed up to some some workouts in uh, less prepared, I'd say, than I would normally be. But I'm um, I'm also trying to prove a point, you know, like trying to show that people need to have fun. And uh, so, anyways, he he said something, and he said, you know, so what does till the wheels fall off even mean to you? And the only thing he wrote me like eight messages, and I respond I respond to everybody on social media as long as you're not graphic or like just being a dick. I respond to everybody. So he asked me that, and I just decided to respond. I told him, "Till the wheels falls off" means I don't pull out; I just leave it in the soak. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! 
<laughs> he pissed me off just the right way, man. <laughs> Dude, that probably. Uh, I I want to know. I want to just be a fly on the wall when he read that. <laughs> I know. I wish I would have had him on Facetime then, man. Yeah. Uh, man. So you mentioned. Uh, well, actually, let me ask you this then. So you mentioned fans and and people reaching out to you when people follow you on your various social media platforms or hear you on an interview. What do you want? Uh, I usually save a deeper question like this for later, but what do you want for your legacy to be? What do you want people to remember when they think about fucking Robert Oberst, you know? Yeah, it's it's pretty simple, man. I just want people to remember me for who I am. I don't, I, it's really hard not to project something on people. You know, it's really hard. Like when you see a guy who's strong and he does this and that, not to project whatever your feelings about what that person should be on them. So, you know, I just kind of hope that people see me for who I really am. And I would, I would hope that people understood that I wasn't judgmental. I was, I was, I try to be kind to everybody and open and, you know, I never, I never pretended to be something that I wasn't like, I feel one of my biggest things that I try to, to do is make people who don't feel comfortable with themselves feel a little bit better. As I grew up, I was very chubby as a kid and I got picked on relentlessly. I had a bunch of problems with that and then it really shaped who I was. And then all of a sudden I get this seven inch growth spurt in one summer and all of a sudden I'm a cool kid because I'm an all American football player. Right. So mm. like I, I remember feeling the way I did and then feeling it change all of a sudden. And, uh, my heart really goes out to those, especially those kids who are dealing with something like that. As I, I was also very poor. We, we, we had 10 kids in a three bedroom house and throughout high school, most of it, we didn't have any electricity. So my dad would come home from work on the weekends with a little generator, plug it in and we'd have like maybe a light and some warm water. And that was, that was just normal life, you know? Mm. So I, I, I hope for the most part that those kids can see what I'm doing or can, you know, hear about it or some way or another that it would affect them and make them feel that they can do whatever they want. I coached high school football for two years before my career took off. And it was the, the best feeling in the world. When those kids, they would come up to me and they'd have these big excited eyes and they'd be either telling me about practice or whatever, whatever they were talking about. They, the excitement that they had because they had me to uh, kind of bounce things off of and an adult who would also listen and understand what they were going through. Like I, that was the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my entire life. Yeah, I bet. And do you ever reach back to people in your hometown now? Oh yeah. I've, uh, like There's probably 15, maybe like 17 of those kids that still write me, talk to me all the time. I just got invited. One of them just graduated college and I got invited and then uh, I couldn't be there, but I sent him a little card and everything. Yeah. And, uh, that... Talk to him all the time, man. I got, there's kids that, that had a lot of the same problems I did that, that uh, either coaches or teachers didn't believe that they were going to be able to be on the team or that they were a good person to have around or they, whatever the situation was. And I, I remember one specifically that I stood up for and I, cause I saw myself in this kid. He even looked exactly like I did when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I was telling him, no, you gotta, you gotta let this kid play. He's, he's a good kid. He just needs a little bit. He needs a little bit of love, you know? And that was his sophomore year. And then when, uh, when he became a senior, he was captain on the team on a roll and now he's going to college and he was like about to drop out before that. Mm. So that kind of stuff, man, that's, that's, that feels better than any trophy or, or anything else like that. That, that stuff is for life. You feel good about it. Yeah, for sure. And how much of your success now do you attribute to those, uh, kind of humble beginnings? I don't know, man. I never really thought about it like that. I know I'm, I'm, constantly hungry not like in the literal sense but figuratively <sighs> a lot of that stuff also comes like from my mom my mom was always very positive she was always like this voice in my head that told me i could do whatever and i i believed her because she believed it and that i attribute a lot of my success to that being poor when you're a kid being poor is like it's just when it's when it is what it is it just feels like it's normal you think 
everybody's like this, right? right. And then and you get these little wake up calls and that pops in your head like, okay, so I, I am different because I'm poor, but it's, it's not the same. Like if you're poor as an adult, like you know, you're poor, you know, it's, it's a different thing. Uh, for us, it was just, this is the way it was, you know? Yeah, for sure. It's interesting that you mentioned your, your mom saying, you know, you can be whatever you want because it's a, it's an innocent thing. And I think it, people say it, but it, it's, it's so at a time when you're developing, it shapes your worldview. And if you have that worldview, like you really are capable of a lot more than somebody that doesn't, you know, that somebody that thinks like, Oh, I, I have to go take this nine to five. Cause that's what my dad does. Yeah. There's so many people out there that we all know who are pessimistic or they just, they feel like there's this limit to what they're capable of and that that's just broken into them as they grow up. Like somebody laughs at a dream that they have or somebody tells them that they're bad at this or, that, or whatever it is, you know, they slip and fall and they're, they're looking to their parents to have a little bit of, uh, you know, support and it's not there. Whatever that may be, whatever caused that to them, it's broken out of us. For me, it was just built up like crazy. Like I just, I I never in my life felt like I couldn't do something, even when it was ridiculous. Like I just, I like, yeah, I could do that. Cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's interesting. I have a a close friend of my my girlfriend's who's going through a time right now where you know he just doesn't really feel like he's capable of more. And I'm just curious because you you have done so much and and you're still uh would say trending upward, right? Still starting new I'm things, trying, yeah, trying comedy and stuff. What do, what do you think, uh, what do you have to say to those people, I guess? Because that's a, that's a hard mindset to get somebody out of. Man, it's, it's, you got to constantly remind yourself of your value. Put, I mean, put notes up, write a little note on the mirror, have, have things that remind you. Like when I was in, uh, when I was in football, I used to put a rubber band around my wrist. And every time I, I made a mistake to whatever I was working on, or let's say I was trying to be more positive. Every time I made a mistake, and I wasn't positive. I just snap it real quick and then move forward. You don't want you if you're trying to be positive. You don't want to soak in that. Oh, I messed up again because that's just being more negative. Right. You snap, you snap the band, move forward. That's it. And then it helps you. It trains you. It's stuff like that. Really, it's just a consistent effort in trying to be better, whatever that may be. And that's I think in everything, man. I mean, I'm constantly trying to grow. Uh, every day in any way possible i'm reading new stuff and studying trying to find new stretches or whatever it is you know like it's it's very important that everyone try to do that yeah for sure and and do you have a family now i do i do i have a son okay how are you um i guess like are you how do you how do you instill that uh that mindset in him i guess well, he's two, so it's okay. not quite as much. <laughs> okay. But um, I'm already working on the the difference, you know, like we were saying, in being positive, the the idea of faith in himself, you know, and finishing, following through with stuff. Like those are little things that you can you can work in already. Like when he pulls out a book that he wants me to read with him. And halfway through, he's like, oh, and he tries to take off, like, no, 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 we started this book, let's sit down and finish it, you know, kind of stuff like that. I th I think that that goes a long way, and hey, I'm, I might be fucking him up, I don't know, maybe it's like the worst thing I could ever do, <laughs> but he's going to grow up and be addicted to freaking weird shit because of me, but. Yeah. Uh, right, right. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, I, I interview a lot of people through this podcast and a lot of successful people. And one of the things that I always think about is success leads clues, right? And having that growth mindset is something that I would say 98% of people that I interview just tend to have. They're, they're very open and addicted to that growth uh, in everything that they do. It's shaped who I am. It definitely has. Yeah, for sure. So I have a couple of training questions for you. So you said that you, uh, you're right now, you're at a slim... 375. What, uh, how much did you weigh be like prior to Strongman? Uh, I graduated high school at 375. I was 420 pounds when I was in Africa. Uh, my last world strongest man, I tore my bicep. Oh, shit. Okay. So is, you had to take some time off then for that torn bicep, huh? Right. Yeah. Did you get surgery? No, it didn't tear all the way through. And it was in the meat of the bicep. So I was very lucky that it didn't go all the way through because you can't actually get surgery. On that part of your bicep. Damn, okay. Did you do it on stones? No, I did it on these stupid barrels we were loading. 
it was uh big metal barrels that we were throwing up and I I felt it go on the first barrel and I I loaded two more like an asshole I should have stopped but I got lucky I got lucky yeah so how are you how are you treating it then if you weren't able to do surgery it's all it, it's all good now this time you I just rested it. it oh yeah yeah it's just leave it alone okay and uh, a little bit of massage therapy but it, even with that it wasn't much of that until towards the end Okay. Yeah. Did you in ice and just like anti-inflammatory shit like that? Yeah. You know, the real, the real trick to like feeling better is just cocaine and waffles. Yeah. Always. <laughs> 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 you off guard there, huh? Yeah. <laughs> if, yeah. If those can't fix it, you're, you're probably fucked, huh? You're fucked, man. Have you ever seen a truck driver that looks like he's having a bad time? <laughs> no, I guess not. <laughs> so, all right, next question: fasted cardio is that is that something you do a lot? I do it four to six times a week, depending on how froggy I feel. Okay, and what is the what's the reason for that? Because it's hard. Because it's uh, good for me. Okay, like body composition, or or is it more of like no? Because it's it's a difficult thing to do, and it's a good way to start your day. It's for me. It's the I like explosives. I don't do like long distance cardio. I have a, a trail that I hike. I hike to the base of this switchbacks part of this uh, trail, and it's about a mile in. And then the switchbacks is oh, it's in my last video I put up. It's about fifty. It's about maybe two hundred yards ish. Um, it might be like one seventy. Okay. Switchbacks. And it's pretty steep. So I get to the base, and then I sprint that as hard as I possibly can. And I walk back down, take five, ten minutes, and then I hit it again, and then I walk home. And, uh, you know, I do that um, on an empty stomach because it's harder. And I do that sprint because it's that's actually more uh, applicable to what I do. Sure. Long-distance cardio doesn't really work for big guys. Right. But if you're doing sprints, recovering sprints, that's football cardio. That's that's what I've been doing since I was 13. So I, I'm good at that. Yeah. Goddamn, dude. If I sprinted first thing in the morning, I'm tearing my hamstrings up. <laughs> well, wait. It's hot here first thing in the morning, too. So you just warm up. Plus, when you walk a mile in and it's pretty uphill, you're warmed up by the time you get there. Yeah. Okay. Sure. And do you, do you use any supplements at all? Yeah. I work with GAT supplements. And what I like to do... Daily right now. I do protein, obviously. I okay. Do protein. They've got a great one that's like really low carbs, so I don't have to worry about it. I'm not trying to be as fat as possible. Like a lot of guys have this idea, like the bigger you are, the stronger you are. I went on the Arnold stage and I was 427 and I felt like garbage. I'm 370-ish right now, maybe a little lighter, and I feel stronger than I ever was. So it's not... I don't believe in this whole, the bigger you are, the stronger you are, shit. I think that's lazy people's excuses for eating like shit and not doing cardio. Yeah. That's just how I feel. So what I do is I take sport greens, which is like vitamins and stuff. It's uh, It was made by a guy who works with Olympic athletes in um, Flagstaff, Arizona. Okay. It's, it's, so like a lot of these greens that people take, they don't, you don't absorb them for some reason. I can't give you the science background on all this shit. Yeah. yeah. I, just know, I just know that when they test your levels, it actually works. I do that in omega-3 fish oils, aminos, um, and then uh, glutamine. I put glutamine in all my shakes. Okay. And so what is your diet like then? So you said you're not one of these guys that just crushes carbs. No. I do uh, mostly – the only carbs I do a day right now are uh, I get one cup of rice. With uh, with chicken in one of my meals. My first meal of the day is like the best tasting meal, and it's cereal and a shake. Okay. So like like cinnamon toast crunch, like it's really good. I got a good nutritionist, Nathan Payton, who does Brian Shaw's nutrition. A couple other guys. He's really really good, and uh, we dialed it in, man. We tinkered with it for a while. We went keto for about four weeks to get me going. Mm. Holy crap, keto Rough, huh? lifting will kick your ass. I was I'm a nice guy, but I turned into an asshole. Like week two, I was freaking out on people. It was brutal. Yeah, keto's it's rough. I have a lot of experience with it actually. Did you find that your uh your top end lifts went down a lot when you were in keto? Oh yeah, for sure. Okay. For sure. Yeah. 
But I mean, I can't say how like how that applies to other people. Like in my experience, I went from eating anything and everything to going keto, and like I was lifting maximal weights at the time I was prepping. So like in that case, it's a stupid call. Except for my goal was to drop the weight, and it worked. It was yeah. rough. Yeah. It worked. Yeah, no, it's brutal. I have a, I think there's a ton of application for an endurance athlete. And then I think that yeah, maybe it works for some people, but everybody I've talked to that's tried it for maximal strength has seen their shit kind of fall pretty hard. Sure. Yeah. I mean, even it took me a long time to even get used to as little carbs as I have right now. Mm-hmm. So it took me about, you know, like two, three months before I was like, okay, I'm me again. I'm good. But right. now, like, man, I'm telling you now, I like if I cut down like uh carbs for like two days and then i have a cheat meal i'm shredded in the morning i'm all veiny and like have side abs and shit what the sound guy you know has side abs <laughs> uh zajunas that's the only one no he doesn't have side abs i promise you that no <laughs> definitely not all right it sounds like i'll tell you a story i'll tell you a story about big z from okay. before like, when he was big sure. so my first world strongest man we were in china and uh, I was the only rookie in the finals. I was really happy to be there, and it was a good time and everything. It was the day we were flying out, and I wanted to go down to the shore one last time, you know, just, you know, have a little moment to myself. And uh walk down to the beach. We're in Sonia, China. Walk down to the beach, and I'm sitting there in the sand just looking out. You can see, I don't remember if it's uh, Thailand or something like that. You can see one of the islands right across, and and it's just really cool looking. So and I, I've been there, and it's time to go. So I get up, and I turn around to walk back up this hill to head back. And there's there's Big Z just standing there in his tiny little Speedo, just staring off into the water. <laughs> just, you know, just the, the smallest Speedo you can imagine. The biggest <laughs> gut that Z's ever had, like the huge gut. And he's got this look on his face like he, like he wants to pick a fight with the ocean, you know? Uh-huh. That's, like, that's just how he looks. And as I'm walking, I'm realizing that somebody's ru- like as I get around towards the side, I'm realizing somebody's rubbing oil on him, and it's <laughs> it's Vitotus Lawless and another Speedo rubbing him down with oil <laughs> while he's standing there just mean mugging the ocean with his big old gut hanging out. What the fuck? <laughs> oh man, Eastern Europeans they don't give a fuck about that stuff, man. It's like whatever. So did you make fun of him, and that's why now he got really cut? No. I would never make fun of the strongest man who ever lived. I have, I have a lot of respect. Okay. I'm telling that story. And, uh, uh, it's honest, so I can tell it. But I would never, I would never make fun of him. That man is is a hero to me. Yeah. No. Yeah. He is an absolute savage. <laughs> Freaking monster. The the time he put in, how healthy he was. Just the whole list of attributes. Like people don't even realize that guy. I mean, twenty plus years banging weights for a living and he's he's never disappeared like he never had to take a year off because of injury he never ran away because of this or that like he got banged up a little bit but he just kept soldiering through it's crazy savage yeah yeah absolutely so um i know i want to be cognizant of your time so i just want to ask you a couple more questions so for people that are listening to this you've been really successful at making your passion a not only a lifestyle but also a profession and A lot of times when people have these, like they're passionate about a niche sport, like strongman or something, that's a really difficult thing to do because there's not always a ton of money into it. So how do you think, uh, what do you contribute to your success? And then how do you think other people could probably be successful based around what they might be passionate about? Well, the first thing was when I got into the sport, I never listened to anybody tell me that I couldn't make money at it. I, I mean, like I told you, like I have that ridiculous space in myself. Yeah, I I knew I was gonna do it. I didn't know how. I didn't. I didn't even understand the sport. I had to Google it the day I decided to figure what this was out. On the same day I decided I was gonna make this my form of income, I was literally Googling what is strongman, and that was that was like almost was less than five years ago. So it was a mentality going in that I was just I wasn't gonna fail. I there was no way that I wasn't gonna make this work. And it's going to take that. If you want to make a sport like this pay you or something else that's, you know, comparable in size, you're going to have to have a lot of fucking faith in yourself. Yeah. You can't, go in, you can't come in pussyfooting and think, oh, it'll figure itself out. That doesn't work that way. Right. You gotta, yeah, you got to come in swinging. Uh, what, I, what I did was I, I didn't neglect the entertainment aspect of this show. 
I didn't neglect that. I I knew the uh, the value of being memorable, of of being open and vulnerable. Being vulnerable, people don't understand the value of that. Like it's if, if you want people to relate to you, they gotta have some sense of who you are. Mm. Like, you can't you can't put up a big wall, pretend to be something you're not, and have droves of people come flocking to you. It doesn't happen like that. People have got to feel connected to you in some way, or they're not they're not going to be there to click on your links and buy your stuff and follow you. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. So I knew that it wasn't just about being the strongest; it was about being memorable, being entertaining, and you got to you got to sell your ass, man. Like I I would. I would walk around expos and speak to everybody and I I would I would go back and forth between, you know, overly confident and overly um respectful, I would call it I guess. Mm-hmm. So like try to try to play that out and see which one was working the best. I wrote emails and I did a lot of stuff and it just it came together out of persistence. And that sounds silly because it only took me about two years to where I was set up. But in those two years, I never took a single day where I wasn't contacting someone, reaching out to somebody, trying to find out what the what's this supplement company doing and how come they don't have athletes. And if this company has athletes, why am I not one? And like things like that. Like I was never off for those two years. I never, I never was like, oh, I'll figure it out tomorrow or take take a list and put it together for the weekend. Every single day I was chasing it. Yeah, and I can double down on that because I've, I've uh, owned a few companies that have sponsored athletes. And it's uh, as a company, it's super hard to get a return on your investment in an athlete. So having an athlete that is uh, focused on something like that is super fucking important. Yeah, and you got to show it too. You can't, you got to realize when you're talking to a company you want to sponsor you, it's a job interview, but it's like 20 times a job interview. And you got to show them, like you said, it's really hard to get your return on an athlete. Yeah. You have to show them in minutes that you're the guy that'll give them that return or, mm-hmm. or girl. Yeah, absolutely. And I think people are, are attracted to you based one, because you have that blind faith and two, because you're, you're, uh, very real about the journey. And then three, because, you know, you know, you know what it takes to, to make it, which is selling something, right? Yeah. So yeah. spe- speaking I, of selling something, I know you have a ton of sponsors, so we should probably <laughs> plug on the go towels right now for linking us up. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you on the go towels. <laughs> um, the people who take care of me, it's simple. It's got, got supplements. Like I told you guys what I take and they support, they don't just support me. They support strong men. They support shows, put stuff together. The difference in athletes and the opportunities they have since Gat got involved has been huge. It's one of those things that people need to pay more attention to. You know, we had MHPs uh, uh, bringing people out and, and signing them and stuff, and it was all these top guys, and it was kind of all we had. Then all of a sudden, it was there's like seven different companies now that have guys, and, and then there's more interested and things like that. That that's all from Gat. Gat's growth be- that literally brought all of that to us. Other people started seeing the success, seeing how it was working, and it started coming out. So. I think the sport of strongman itself owes Gat a thank you, but um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously biased as well. Yeah, yeah, but that's rare too, right? Finding a company that's willing to invest in the athletes. On the flip side, right. that is hard. Yeah, especially like they'd never done it before. They were bodybuilding guys. That's all they'd ever had. Right. And they took me on, and it worked. It just clicks, you know. It's we're we're a good combo, and it's helped out with other guys. I mean. There's other companies that are following in Gat's, uh, not footsteps, but their, their kind of business plan because it's worked so well. But, um, we got them and then on the go towels is, has been really nice. They set us up with this whole, we just did a tour called Till the Wheels Fall Off. Literally just got home and it was wild and fun and crazy and all that stuff. And, uh, it, I wanted, I really wanted to show the other side of what, what we do rather than, you know, just another gym video. Yeah. I just wanted to show some fun, and we do. We have, we have a lot of fun. We have too much fun in some of them. I crashed a fucking Vespa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what sucks? The Vespa thing, like, I was just fucking around. We didn't even have a camera on me, and nobody was around. I was just fucking around and crashed the damn thing. I, <laughs> they would have been worth it if somebody saw it or somebody recorded it. 
Yeah. Because then it'd be fine. I'm cool with looking like a dick if it, like people think it's funny. I'm fine with that. But when I bust myself up for nothing, I was pissed. Yeah, dude. Yeah. I was, I was turning. I was flipping around into the street. And uh, it was, you know, a Vespa, like, it's the handle brake is, is kind of more like a bicycle brake. It's, you got to really squeeze the shit out of it. It's not like a motorcycle. Like, I'm used to riding motorcycles, and you can just two-finger touch the brake, and it slows you down and all that. So with the Vespa, you got to really squeeze it. So I'm trying to turn around. And I'm squeezing the brake, and I accidentally crank the throttle. And I'm I'm halfway across the street, cranking the throttle. Throttle. I hit the curb sideways, flipped forward off the Vespa, and I went ribs first into a stop sign. Fell down, busted my knee all up. The Vespa had the biggest dent I fucking could have put into it without it breaking in half. It was it was fucked up, but. You know. Yeah, and just like that, we know the real meaning of till the wheels fall off. <laughs> exactly. Power break a motor exactly. scooter. Exactly. Nice. You know what's funny? It was on the last day, my fucking, my wheel bearing on my tire busted, and my, my wheel literally fell off my truck. So we were, like, stuck on the side of the road fixing my wheel like this. We should not have named the tour till the wheels fall off. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, what was the tour? What was it about? It was just that, man. It was trying to promote how we deal with strength and, and with our style, our flavor, you know? Nice. It nice. Was, I'm, I want people to have more to life than this single-mindedness. And there's a lot of people out there who they latch onto this one thing. And it's like, okay, I've got my nine to five, but the, the only thing I'm living for is this one little thing, whether that be getting drunk on the weekend or or this TV show, or whatever, whatever your thing is, if it's weightlifting, or, or anything like that, I, we need to diversify, we need to open our minds up, have fun, get out there and actually live life, don't, don't get caught up in these one thing, or this, these little, like, there's so many people who will live and die by a number that they lift, or anything, anything even similar to that, and it's, I think that we'd all be a lot happier if you went out and hiked in the woods once in a while and just had some fun. Go go take some friends and go jump in a lake and swim around. And there's just way more to life than any one thing, no matter what that one thing is. Right. Yeah, when you're passionate about something, it's really easy to get entrenched in that thing. So far, so like that you end up fucking hating it, you know? Yeah. 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 It That's happens it. a lot. Yeah, especially with training, right? Dudes end up spending, like, it's happened to me, like, you just end up spending, like, six hours in the gym, and then you get to a point, you're like, what the fuck am I even doing here? Right. Yeah. And life just keeps passing you by, you know, and you're, pretty soon you're doing it out of routine, and you're not even having fun anymore. Mm -hmm. like, what's the point? Right. Right, exactly. So, that's actually a perfect segue into the Lionheart Kicker. So, uh, if you, the Lionheart Kicker is, if you could give uh, blanket advice, and it were guaranteed to be translated in every language guaranteed everybody would hear it they might not all follow it but they would hear what you said what would you uh what would you tell people i would say be yourself no matter how uncomfortable it makes you or anyone else mm. pretty, pretty yeah simple. yeah i don't really have a lot of follow-on questions i really <laughs> I like that <laughs> <laughs> it's simple it's straightforward it's it's exactly what i believe in i've always that's i started wearing uh pink shoes in competitions and people would always give me shit at the beginning like you know it's not a tough guy thing to do, but in my mind, whatever the hell I'm doing, that's what a tough guy would do because I'm actually a tough guy. <laughs> so I didn't feel like like I had to bend to other people's wills. And I think it's something that a lot of people can take a little lesson from. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I would even I would even wager that that actually paid off for you even more, right? Because it made you more memorable in, in what you're trying yeah. to do. <laughs> yeah, it worked out great for me. Yeah. <laughs> But do you ever have those feelings? Do you ever have like a feeling like, damn, maybe I'm like, I, I just think I, with a lot of people that are listening to this, it's easy to do something uh, because you, I, I guess because you think that's what people want to see of you, right? Or or hear of you. So it, that seems like a, it's easier said than done, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Most definitely. Most definitely. Um, and I, I get stuff like that all the time. This This whole tour was risky. It was. It would have been much easier for me to just work out in a gym and keep putting up little numbers and and simple things like that, 
it's so much easier for me not to step out of that little niche comfort zone. Mm-hmm. But I just I I did it anyways. I I literally repeatedly told stories just in this podcast about doing shit specifically because I think it's hard or I don't want to do it. I, just two days ago, I'm terrified of heights. Like terrified. I can't even climb a fucking ladder. Okay. Death of heights. Two days ago, we're at the lake. We drive by, and I see this guy jump off a rock into the lake. And I was like, stop, let's stop the boat. We got to go over there. I got to do this. It was the last day that we were out there. And I, I felt like I saw that because I needed to do it. Like, I had to do something, like, to push one of my biggest fears, you know. And I freaking jumped out the boat, swam over, climbed up. And I'm on top of the rock, like, shaking, just scared to death. And I was like, you know what? You just, you just got to fucking do it. Do it. And jumped off, jumped out. Obviously, I'm okay. Everything was great. And then when you come up from the water after something like that, it's it's fucking beautiful, man. It yeah. feels great. Like my coach used to always tell us in football, there's no pain in the end zone. And that's the truth. You don't feel pain in the end zone. When, whenever it's hard to do something, whatever, when, when you don't want to do it, when you're scared to do it, after you're done, all that stuff is gone. It doesn't exist in the end zone. Yeah. Hell yeah. Did you have a moment when you stood on that cliff and you were like, why the fuck did I say I would do this? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah. It's on tape. I got it. I'm going to post it. It's on tape. I'm up there and I look over and I, and my, my best friend Kale's filming. And I was like, I was like, why the fuck did I do this? I'm terrified of heights. And then I'm looking down and then you see me just shrug my shoulders and go, fuck it. And I jump. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I was, I was like really scared. I almost pulled back and didn't, but I was, it's one of those things, like, I felt that that fear, it was it was something that I needed to feel. It's something that I had to do. You you don't need to go out there and, like, you know, try and break your neck and do crazy shit all the time, but you need to do stuff that scares you. you yeah. Have to. Right. Yeah, absolutely. If I could sum up a lot of what you said, you know, a lot of this interview, it seems like, to me, just listening as a, as a bystander, it seems like you've bet on yourself consistently. And it's fucking paid off for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's pretty much it, man. And it, even if it hadn't paid off, I would still do it the same way. Like I, even the stuff that I've done that hasn't worked out, it's way better to me than, than having to, you know, tuck my tail in and try and do what somebody else wants me to do or anything like that. Like, at least this way, you, you get to ride around a free man, you know, if you're not... You're not stapled down like a lot of people are. It's You see people who just, they hate their life completely and they choose to do the things that they hate, even though they know it's killing them. They know it's like causing cancer and all this other shit. It's, I got way darker than I wanted to there. <laughs> you know, it's that, that kind of stuff. It's, it's everywhere. It's, you would, I would say it's the majority of the population. Uh, 100% agree. That right there, it would be really cool if if there was people who just decided to shake that shit off and, and move forward, you know? It, I think I think a lot of our problems would dissipate. I think we would we would be smarter and happier as a country. It's it's something that I hope that, that maybe, you know, the enough enough people we get trying and uh, promoting that idea the better better chance we have at least helping somebody. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you make a decision to, you know, live on your feet rather than die on your knees, you know, and, and you know. that's a great way of putting it. Yeah. And, and when you fail, you know, you learn from it and then you move on smarter and, and better. Yeah. Dust yourself off and go again, man. That's the American dream. Yeah. You, you dig a hole so big, you don't know how the fuck you're going to get out. And <laughs> yeah. Fuck yeah, man. I really appreciate you taking the time, brother. Thank you. Thanks for having me, man. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to Lionheart Radio. I hope that the information from today's show will make you fitter, happier, and healthier. For the show notes of this episode and every episode, head to www.lionheartrad.io. Yep, just like Lionheart Radio. And please, if you have the time, head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. It really helps us to know that we're on the right track in delivering you reliable information and value. As always, feedback is welcome. If you have any comments on the show or like to suggest a guest, send me an email at rick at louisville.com. That's L-U-A-V-I-V-E. 
Com. Thanks for your support, yeah. and we will see you next time. <laughs> Bitch, I feel good. Don't I look stupendous? My shine is so endless, and shit you can do to end this. Even when I'm dead, niggas still gon' bump that chip shit. Coke, white, escalate on switches for you dipshit. So you won't forget this. Me and West, nigga, be the coldest. People in-